This is the sixth devlog for Blast Processed, my first person platformer built around rocket jumping and the community made jump maps of Team Fortress 2. Watching the previous episodes shouldn't be strictly necessary, but doing so will put into context the work I've done up to this point. I've been a bit less open about the contents of this devlog in the lead up to its release, and I hope it's clear as to why based on the intro, but it's also because I am now sure of how I'm going to be releasing the game, which is coming sooner than you might have expected. So let's get into that. I'm going to start out with the release details, as I figure that's what will be of most interest to most people watching. The Steam store page for the game is now public and is linked in the description, so you can now wishlist the game to be notified when it releases. There's some information about the game on this page already, but I do have some more info to talk about here. Firstly, in the first devlog, I said that I decided to do this sort of open development with this game in particular due to the lack of narrative elements and a pure focus on gameplay, and this is also why I've decided to initially release the game in early access. I have what I believe is a good reason for doing this, as I'm designing Blast Process to be a game that can support high-level play even though I'm not a high-level player in TF2 rocket jumping. Because of this, I want to get a feel for what high-level play looks like in the game prior to a full release, and I might as well get feedback from beginners as well to sharpen the difficulty curve further. As for what will be introduced over the course of Early Access, the game will release into Early Access lacking two major features, in-game built-in leaderboards, and a level editor with Steam Workshop support. Since I'm going to be doing what I can to never reset the leaderboards after the game's full release, I'll be very restricted in terms of what I'm able to change about the underlying movement mechanics and level design after that point. I want to make sure the game's design can support high-level play before that point, and early access will help to consolidate more hands-on feedback than I possibly could with a closed beta test. Aside from that, an early access release will allow the game to be available in a fully playable state earlier, which I figure is another plus. The game will release into early access with 5 playable maps and all the integral offline features required to play the game, and updates will simply bring more official maps, some minor offline features, and the two aforementioned online features. And to be clear, I'll continue to make these devlogs throughout the early access period, so you can subscribe to be updated on development as soon as I have something new to show. That covers most of what I have to say about my release plans, but I'd like to quickly touch on pricing. I understand that I can't really compete with TF2's existence as a free game if I charge for my game, and since I also just want as many people to try the game as possible, I'm going to release Blast Processed for free. This does come with one caveat, however. My plan for leaderboards is to have a system where players automatically upload replays when they beat their own time, both as a form of verification and to allow those replays to be downloaded directly in-game to view and pick up strategies from other players. I can't do this through Steam leaderboards, since that system is solely built around uploading a single variable to the servers, which renders my planned replay functionality impossible to implement on top of it. Since I'll have to host my own servers for this, the only way for me to make this sustainable is to charge for leaderboard access through a paid DLC. I'm hoping this will be an acceptable compromise, since there's not any other feasible way I could go about this while keeping the game itself free, which is something I really want to do. I'll have more info on those leaderboards once I get closer to implementing it. And as a final note for the release, I have two more devlogs worth of content planned before the game is ready for early access. I'm hoping I'll be able to get that work done faster when compared to this video's development period, but we'll see what happens. Now that I have all my big announcements out of the way, here's what I've gotten done over the past few months. Most of my technical work has gone towards making the game playable without the debug tools at my disposal, which starts with adding a pause and options menu. Luckily, Godot makes doing UI like this very simple, and I was easily able to make a decent looking, scalable options menu. I may end up changing how the UI looks either before early access or before the full release, but the menu as of now is 100% functional. I've made sure to include options which can improve both visibility and performance, such as toggles for individual particle effects like the ambient particles and rocket smoke, as well as some options inspired by the source engine like ViewModel FOV. For now, there are two options that may stand out to those who are familiar with source movement, the first of which is a functional recreation of the popular null movement scripts for TF2. When you hold down opposing movement keys like A and D at the same time, most FPS games will interpret this as if you're holding neither. A null movement script for source games instead only passes the most recently pressed of the two keys. These sorts of scripts have been part of a recent controversy, 
where keyboard manufacturers created their own external null movement scripts, which caused Valve to ban their use in Counter-Strike 2. However, to my knowledge, they are not banned in TF2's community competitive play since they trivialize far fewer skills in a game where movement is much faster and comes without accuracy penalties. I'm unsure of whether or not it's legal in competitive jump or other movement games like Surf, but I'm not too worried about its potential negatives when it feels so intuitive to use and can help further my goal of increasing consistency in movement, which is why I've gone so far as enabling it by default. The other standout option is simplified air strafing, which demands a thorough overview of my rationale for implementing it, since the act of simplifying air strafing can have drastically different effects on how the game is played depending on how it's implemented. The implementation I have currently simply ignores forward inputs when the player is both airborne and holding a strafe key, which allows you to air strafe while holding forward. This is what I've found to be the compromise between having no simplified air strafing setting and having one that is powerful enough to obsolete default settings. Another potential implementation is to allow air strafing while only holding forward, which would be done by reading if the player turned left or right on a given tick and triggering either a left or right input respectively for that tick. This greatly lowers the skill ceiling associated with air strafing by giving all players 100% consistent tick-perfect direction switching, which is a skill and source movement that I'm not willing to sacrifice for the sake of accessibility. In service of keeping that skill requirement intact, I found that my implementation was the best compromise between accessibility and not allowing players to sidestep the skills associated with air strafing. The last thing to note about the pause menu is that it doesn't actually pause the game, which I've decided to do both for my own convenience and development and for the health of the speedrunning meta. There are many examples of speedruns where pausing has become a degenerate tactic for the metagame. Celeste had to change the way pausing interacts with its timer multiple times in patches to ensure it's not an oppressive strategy, and games like Minecraft still pause the in-game timer when in the pause menu, which allows for controversial strategies like stronghold calculators to become viable in speedruns. So even aside from the concerns I have for how pausing the physics processes might interact with the replay system, I think it's better for the menu to simply be a menu rather than a pause menu, for the sake of guaranteeing 100% that the ability to pause the game at will can't be abused. Since my maps lack any sort of obstacles that will enforce failure states independently of player movement, opening up the menu and going AFK in the middle of a map during casual playthroughs shouldn't cause any issues, so I'm happy to leave the menu to work in this way. Aside from this, you'll also notice that I have working transitions in between maps, which I made to add a bit of visual flavor to the game while being very short so they don't become annoying. This principle has also dictated how I've implemented connectivity between the hub area and maps, which will simply be through a menu containing every available map that appears when entering this area in the hub. This menu is also accessible through the pause menu in the hub for even greater convenience, which allows you to enter maps within seconds of opening the game if you want. The map select menu itself is a placeholder for now, but in the initial release, each button will feature a screenshot of the corresponding map before entering it, and once you've selected a map, you'll be able to choose a replay to race against, or choose to replay the tutorials associated with that map if you've already completed them. As for other technical work, I wanted to quickly mention a change to the game's tick rate. In the fourth devlog, I go into great detail on how tick rates work and how important they are for both TF2 Jump and Blast Processed and I explicitly state that I've set the tick rate to 60, but after testing a few things, I've decided to slightly increase the tick rate to 64. To explain as simply as possible, the game's tick rate directly affects the delta time variable that is used each frame, which is a floating point number. Computers don't represent each decimal point in a decimal number as an individual integer, which means that they have limited precision when representing decimal numbers in between powers of two. By changing the tick rate to 64, I ensure that the delta time variable is always exactly 0.015625 internally, which should provide at least slightly more consistent results in movement. If I never mention this change and release the game with a tick rate of 64, 99.9% .9 of people would never notice. But for the sake of transparency, and even if it makes no difference to most players, I feel the need to at least mention it. I've saved discussion of level design for last, but there's one more big thing I've started work on, which you've already heard some of at the very start of this video. Music. Before starting work on this game, I had only barely touched composition and music production with very simple tools like ORG Maker, which is why I did not compose the soundtrack for my first game. 
but since Nathan, my friend who composed the soundtrack for the top, has more significant obligations to attend to, I'm going to be composing the soundtrack for Blast Processed. While I'm still getting help from Nathan for a few things on the production side of things, I'm doing the bulk of the work in composing and producing myself, which was the main bottleneck for getting this devlog finished, since I plan to have a store page with a trailer ready. Now that I've put together a couple tracks, I'm a lot more confident in my abilities to get the rest of the music done. The song in the trailer also plays in the title screen, while the song that's been playing in the background as I've been talking is the hub theme, which is a bit more subdued while still matching the sort of tone and style I'm aiming for with the music. to arguably the most important work I've done for this devlog, which is once again more level design. Since the last video, I've made one and a half maps, each with a set of three tutorials, the first of which is the city map I talked about briefly at the end of the last video, which I've now named Metropolis. This has been the most challenging map to create for the game thus far, as it has come with the most drastic changes I've had to make to a map based on playtesting. This was to be expected though, as this is the point in the game in which I introduce air strafing, which was always going to be the trickiest part of the entire learning curve to get right. My full explanation of air strafing can be found in the first devlog, but what's important to understand is that it's a technique which unlocks the full potential of movement in the Source Engine games by allowing the player to turn in mid-air, and which requires a very specific set of inputs to perform. Communicating how to air strafe is thus the most critical lesson the game will teach, so I've taken care to make sure the difficulty curve is as smooth as possible. The first tutorial follows the Mega Man principle of introducing new concepts in the most controlled possible environment, which is a design trick that allows the player to familiarize themselves with the concept before it's used in more complex ways. I do this by taking away the rocket launcher altogether and using scripted momentum to ensure that the only possible significant point of failure is failing to air strafe. The second tutorial forces the player to use air strafing in more complex ways by both changing directions mid-air and air strafing directly out of a rocket jump, and the third is a simple introduction to surfing on steep surfaces. If you remember how I described the set of tutorials last time, you'll notice that there's been a big change to the second tutorial which goes against the conventions of how TF2 jump is conventionally taught. There are two maps in TF2 that have been made for Jump Academy, the group that teaches others how to play jump maps in TF2, which each consist of a set of courses meant to be played in the given order for a comprehensive introduction to rocket jumping. In both maps, the first course is a simple course that teaches the bare essentials, which is somewhat analogous to the beginner map I talked about in the previous devlog. But for TF2 Jump, the creators of the Jump Academy maps decided that the next easiest concept to teach was walls, and since I've been following these maps as a loose guide for what sort of order I should introduce concepts in, I initially made a tutorial for how to wall pogo as the second tutorial for this map. Wall pogos involve jumping off a wall and immediately air strafing back to the wall in order to jump off it again, which can be done multiple times in succession in order to cross large gaps bridged by a wall. Unfortunately, the wall pogos ended up being the main pain point of this map for new players, since the inputs were simply too complex and unintuitive, which wasn't entirely surprising to me. Part of this comes down to the fact that TF2 Jump comes along with an incentive for pushing through its steep difficulty curve and frustrating moments, as many concepts you learn in Jump Maps can be applied to proper TF2 games to improve your performance with the soldier. In designing a standalone game, I've had to wrestle with making the game consistently fun for new players, so that playing the game is incentive enough most of which must be done through making easier maps rather than simpler mechanics in order to retain as much depth in high-level play as possible. So given that goal, I decided to rework the second tutorial to more fully flesh out air strafing, and I reworked the few jumps I had already created with wall pogos in mind, all of which made for a much better new player experience. But aside from removing wall pogos, designing Metropolis has also been difficult in terms of air strafing alone. Air strafing is simply not intuitive to the average player who is unfamiliar with source movement, and while I think I've done the best I can to teach air strafing with tutorials, I also need to limit the complexity in air strafing required for jumps in the map itself. 
This is simply a matter of getting playtesters a varying familiarity with source movement mechanics, seeing how well they perform, and making changes to the problematic parts of jumps that the majority of playtesters don't understand. This mostly involved moving things closer together, and generally expanding the margin of error to the point where new players are challenged, but high-level players can exploit that expanded margin of error to take bigger risks and skip sections of jumps. I'm going to continue to get this map tested, but I'm now a lot happier with its current state compared to the initial state of many of its jumps. With Metropolis in a good state, I've also started to work on the third expert level map, which I've named Palace. There are a lot of firsts in this map compared to the first two maps I've made, the most obvious of which can be found in its visual design. This is the first map I've made that takes place entirely indoors, which has required that I take a new approach to lighting. Both Paradise and Metropolis are lit with a single directional light, which adequately simulates sun slash moonlight, and while there are parts of these two maps that look a bit flat because of it, the skybox makes the visuals much more interesting when outdoors. When making an entirely indoors map, using only a single directional light or completely disabling lighting altogether makes the visuals far too bland, so I instead need to use slightly more sophisticated lighting. So I now have a system for placing omnidirectional lights of any color, light range, and light intensity, which allows for plenty of flexibility and nice features like having the lava in this map emit a subtle orange glow, all while not completely ruining performance. Gameplay-wise, Palace is focused on two new types of jumps, the first of which is the pogo. This type of jump involves hitting yourself with an explosion before you land on the ground you fired at, which can be used in one-off instances to get further in a single jump, as shown in the first tutorial, or they can be chained together along a long stretch of ground, like in the second tutorial. Chaining pogos can be used to cross stretches of ground that you're not allowed to stand on, which is how jump maps in TF2 force the use of pogos, beyond their utility in gaining speed across flat ground. The tutorials for this were relatively straightforward to design, as it's a relatively straightforward technique compared to things like air strafing. The other new type of jump is what's called a speed shot in TF2, though as I lay out at the end of the third devlog, I've made improvements to how speed shots are done to make them much more consistent. In TF2, a speed shot is performed by hitting yourself with a rocket on the same tick that you land on a floor, which allows you to maintain the airspeed you had when landing. Speed shots are a tick-perfect technique, meaning you need to fire the rocket such that it hits you at the exact same time that you land, within 1 66th of a second, which is a clearly dysfunctional mechanic that can be improved. Since I replicate the grounded friction system from Source in my engine, this method for speed shots is still possible as far as I'm aware, though it's essentially made obsolete with the introduction of sliding. The third palace tutorial teaches that the cooldown on firing brought by sliding can be skipped by pressing slide just before landing, making speed shots relatively easy to perform since you lose speed much slower when sliding. This consistency improvement over TF2 makes performing speed shots a reasonable ask for first-time players at this point in the game, and it just makes doing so more fun due to its reliability. Now that I've made it to this third map, and now that pogos and speed shots have been introduced, I'm getting to the part of level design that I've been most excited about, as this marks the point where I've tutorialized enough of the game to start making really interesting jumps with those fundamental building blocks. While I've only designed half the jumps for Palace, it's already shaping up to be the most enjoyable map so far for players like myself who already have experience with jump in TF2. I expect I'll be talking about it more in the next devlog once I get it fully tested. And speaking of the next devlog, at this point I now have a very solid framework for how the rest of the game will function mechanically, as well as how it will look and sound as a matter of presentation. Most of what's left to do is to further expand the game's content through adding more maps, though I still have some very important features to add. In particular, I hope to have all the logistics regarding the in-game speedrun timer complete for the next video, which will intertwine with the replay system to create what I hope will be the best possible system for competitive play. If you want to be notified of when I end up finishing that work, which hopefully won't take another four months, subscribing to the channel is the best way to do it. That's all I have to show for today, but hopefully I'll have more to show you soon.